This is the Fifth Estate Winning Headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you might have missed this morning. We also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 10th of December 2020 and I am Miss Kay. I'm Tom. And I am JM. In case you missed the headlines this morning, here they are. In the Daily Nation, Masters of Double Speak. In the Standard, Walking in the Footsteps of Baba Yao. Mm. And in the Star. SRC plan to cap perks at 60% of basic pay. Yes. Shall we begin with the Daily Nation? Masters of Double Speak. The yeah. article today takes us on a journey back to February 26, 2017, yeah. when ODM boss Raila Odinga led the opposition in a mid morning rally at Uhuru Park to celebrate the release of seven doctors, yeah. union officials, after yeah. um, when they were released by the court for leading an 100 day work boycott. Yes. He then, uh, at that time, the doctors wanted to um, execute a 2013 collective bargaining agreement mm -hmm. and the, uh, saying that the negotiations negotiations took a long time and the agreements were made and they needed the part of the bargain met by the government. Mm. They also wanted the government to address understaffing problems in hospitals before they could go back to work. Yeah. They quote Raila as saying at the time mm -hmm. uh, that he's saying that he should that he stood with the doctors and he vowed to take the CBA fight where it belonged at the doorsteps of President Uhuru Kenyatta whom he labeled at that time as incompetent and heartless. Mm. Then they fast forward to December 7th, 2020, when the doctors again threatened to go on strike, um, complaining about the same thing, 2013, a collective bargaining agreement, understaffing, and now a virus. Mm. So Odinga again, now he's stated to have abandoned his stand and advised the healthcare workers to respect the oath they took. Yeah. They said that Odinga's utterances have portrayed him as a government uh, apologist and he yes. was softened by the March 2018 handshake with President Kenyatta. Yeah. The handshake has, has also transformed, they say, um, DP William Ruto into an opposition leader in his <laughs> own government. They say that he is now shouting from the rooftops about the government's misplaced priorities, his own mm -hmm. government. Yes. But they also <coughs> say that Mr. Odinga and Mr. And Dr. Ruto are not the only ones in the double speak boat. Yeah. They accuse the president himself, who pledged in 2017 to have a health manifesto, manifesto to fix that sector, mm -hmm. but who has now maintained a loud silence yes. as doctors complain of dying at work and being exposed to a deadly virus. I must say that this smacks of envelope journalism. People <laughs> have been paid, Do money you know, has been I, I, poured. I was going to say the same thing this is a sponsored headline mm. and uh, and and the nation uh, masters of double speak i will ask myself the question and then see mm. the currency of politics is lies uh, but that's the nature of politicians they flip-flop mm. uh, is uh, no permanent uh, you know it's, it's there are no permanent uh, enemies and friends just permanent interests mm. so if uh, if if Raila's interests suit him now no matter what he said two years ago it doesn't matter it's only his uh, current interests that do matter Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, an interesting headline nonetheless, uh, but I, I would say we toss that toss <coughs> all together. Yes? Toss it. And, and, uh, and move on to the standard. But before we do so, let me outline the three-point criteria that we use. Uh, is the paper topical or speculative, repetitive or groundbreaking and thoughtful or just plain lazy? That one smacked of... Isn't envelope it's journalism, we've said. Yeah. So we tossed that one. Let, let's look at the standard. Mm -hmm. uh, walking in the footsteps of Baba Yao. And uh, here they're telling us that Governor Sonko will be impeached out of office by any and all means necessary. Yeah. In fact, uh, the standard speculates that his case is cooked. Mm -hmm. And they do mention, uh, or they do compare his uh, path uh, to exit, yeah. um, uh, similar to that one of the former governor of Kiambu, Waitito. Uh, Waitito. Yeah. Now, we're told that activist Okio Mtata on behalf of Sonko went to court yesterday to attempt to stop the Senate from proceeding yeah. with the impeachment motion against Sonko. Yes. It turns out that the uh, Nairobi MCAs uh, uh, sat on, on Zoom and decided to impeach the governor. Uh, and uh, <laughs> on Zoom, oh, precisely on Zoom, it's like being dumped to a text, and uh, precisely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now the Senate Speaker Lusaka yeah. has said uh, yeah. as follows uh, that the investigation of Sonko's matter in plenary will happen on Thursday, 17th, and Friday, 18th of December, after which the 47 senators will be required to take a vote to uphold or reject the decision by the Nairobi County Assembly to impeach. The governor, right, and that will also be conducted via Zoom. Whoa! Uh, now MPs, mostly from the Ruto side, have come out in protest of yeah. this. 
Yeah. But as we saw in the Babayao case, um, what's most likely to happen is that uh, the, 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 the intention to impeach the governor will still proceed and, uh, and the, the, the powers that be will get their say. You know, Jim, uh, the strongholds of the Hustler Nation are being dismantled one by one. Absolutely. The gatekeeper was Mike Sonko. And he will be sent very home. Will be sent home very soon. Very soon. Where yeah. this is going? And uh, take this to the bank and look for a loan. Can put this against loan. This is a dry run for the impeachment of William Ruto. Mm. If uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga have a majority in, in the National Assembly, if they have a majority in the Senate, what do you expect? <laughs> Probably by I had said by end of this year, but who knows? Maybe early next year, mm. we will have a. Uh, a different deputy president. Mm, mm. I particularly like this headline. Mm. Uh, it's uh, humorous, it's satirical, it's yes. effective, all of it. Uh, I think we keep that for now as we consider the staff. Absolutely. <coughs> SSC plan to cut packs at 60% of P. Now, SSC has uh, a plan to cap 60% uh, of your salary of government uh, uh, officer salaries at mm. 60%, and that's for allowances. Now, if they do this, government would end up saving 100 billion shillings every single year. And what they actually say is that if this rule was applied this year, yeah. uh, government would have saved 42 billion shillings uh, because mm. Uh, mm. All, all allowances had amounted to about 322 billion shillings. Mm. Now, what can 42 billion shillings do? If at all, that had, uh, if that, if at all the 60% rule had been applied, we would build, for example, uh, two thicker highways, two super mm. thicker highways. We would, for example, build half of an expressway. We can do one from Nairobi to Langata. We can do so much. We can even do an entire uh, universal healthcare system. Universal healthcare kitty what is about 11 billion shillings. We would multiply that times four. Uh, so I think uh, this would be a good thing. Country would save a lot of money. And uh, why not go ahead and do it? Yeah, not a bad idea. Um, but all in all, I'm not particularly excited by the headline. headline Absolutely. No. I think Absolutely. We, we could toss that one in yes. favour of the standard. Yes. Definitely. And so we have our winning headline from the standard. A lot of the political pieces of equal cartoon in this country, we've got a few part criteria as well. Are the humorous or dry, satirical or pessimistic, and finally effective or just plain lazy? Let's begin with the Daily Nation. We have a caricature, <clears throat> I don't even think it's a caricature, it's a drawing yeah. of the world, mm -hmm. a globe with the face of Africa. And I think then that would be Africa, who's out shopping, mm. global vaccine shopping. And on their shopping cart is a singular vaccine, but there is an abandoned, I don't know whether they call it abandoned, mm. shopping cart that's just moving away ahead of him and he's looking around who has this cart that's full of vaccines. Yeah. I feel like this is... Um, it's a shot. And, yes, it's a shot at Africa. Yeah. Why do we have only a single vaccine? I don't yeah. know whether I'm saying we don't have the capacity to have more, we don't have the resources to get more. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand this cartoon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not particularly creative and not communicating very well. I think we toss that one. Absolutely. Is that, is, that is a daily nation. That's yes. daily nation. And then the standard. We have a cartoon depicting MPs caricatured as pigs and other wild animals in their typical fashion. In a hospital word, ward, and they're soliciting for signatures for the BBI petition <laughs> from COVID-19 invalids. And you see one invalid there is, uh, asking vaccine. No, 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 this is the MP saying yeah. vaccine. Mm. Now yeah. we are here to collect BBI signatures. Very pessimistic. Very, cuts. very pessimistic. Come on, Gendo, you yeah. can do better than this. Let's toss that one as well. But it's uh, nonetheless very funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Satirical. Absolutely. Okay. The star, you have ozone, and there you have caricature of Uhuru Kenyatta. What is that thing called again? Hammock. Um, ha hammock. hammock. Yeah. And uh, under the hammock, uh, uh, he seems to be on holiday, by the way. Yes. And uh, he seems to be saying, I need a well-deserved break. But underneath the hammock, many issues, COVID-19, BBI, locust invasion, no manner of things. Uh, also a rubbish cartoon. Totally rubbish cartoon. In fact, it's a little sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> we have no winning cartoon today. And now, on to our final thought. But before we get there, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So what is our final thought? And now, our final thought, it is inspired by a book entitled das Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, The Collapse of Congo mm. and the Great War of Africa by Jason K. Stans. In this book, Jason Stearns wanted to understand the roots of the violence that has engulfed the Democratic Republic of Congo since 1996. 
Just for context, the Democratic Republic of Congo is a vast country, the size of Western Europe and home to approximately 60 million people. Yeah. And for decades, it was known for its rich geology, which included large reserves of cobalt, copper, diamonds, timber, amongst other things, and for the extravagance of its dictator, Mobutu Sese Seko, yes. but not for violence or depravity. Then in 1996, a conflict began that had at the time of writing of the book cost the lives of over five million people. And yet, despite this high human cost, the war has received little sustained attention from the rest of the world. The international media asks, how do you cover a war that involves multiple different rebel groups and armies of nine countries, and yet does not ha seem to have a clear cause or objective? In the book, Stern's quotes Nicholas Christoph a Times columnist who had campaigned vigorously for human rights crises around crises around the world mm -hmm. on his justification for the limited reporting on the Congo versus the enhanced coverage of Darfur. He said, and I quote, we have within us, and that's us as human beings, yeah. a moral compass that is moved partly by the level of human suffering, and I grant that the suffering is greater in the Congo, yeah. but our compass is also moved by human evil, yes. and that is greater in Darfur. Yeah. So the problem with the Congo, according to Stearns, is that the war did not have a convenient villain like Hitler or the Arab government in Khartoum mm. with a face that could be blamed for the deaths. Mm. In the context, in the contest or in the context of a weak administration handed over by the Belgians to a native population with a limited education, mm. Stearns divides the war into three parts. Yes. Part one is the first Congo war, which ended with the toppling of Mobutu Sese Seko in 1997. Yes. After a brief lull in fighting, the new president, Laurent Kabila, fell out with his Rwandan and Ugandan allies and sparked oh. the second Congo war, yes. which ran from August 1998 until a peace deal reunified the country in June 2003. Yes. Then he says fighting, however, still continues under various uh, varied militia groups yeah. in eastern Kivu region until today, and this can be considered the third episode of the war. Yeah. For Stearns, he says that the trigger for the war in this weakened government context with these multiple actors already in the country yeah. was came in 1994 after the genocide in neighboring Rwanda when, when the Tutsi RPF led by Kagame took power and yes. over a million Hutus fled the border into Zaire as it had been called by Mobutu at that time along with the soldiers, the militiamen and the militiamen who had carried out the massacres. Mm. The book itself focuses more on the perpetrators than the victims, as well as the nature of the system that brought the principal actors to power, the limited choices they could make, and produced the chaos and suffering that is Congo at the moment. Hey, it's fantastic. Um, the Congo is complex. But one will not uh, mention Jean, uh, sorry, uh, Laurent Desire Kabila, without mentioning Uganda, without mentioning uh, Rwanda. Now, I'll tell you uh, a, a small story. Laurent Desire Kabila was known as a Muzetatu. And uh, Laurent Desire Kabila, uh, 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 Paul Kagame, who was a chief intelligence officer of Kaguta Museveni, actually used to have dinner in the same small shanty. Uh, in the bushes of uh, Uganda, just before Museveni took power uh, from Milton Obote. Now, uh, 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 Museveni gets to power, Kagame gets to power, and they both uh, decide to help this, Mza, this man called Mzetatu, uh, Loro Desire Kabila, to get into power. Mm. Now, Loro Desire Kabila used to have a, sm uh, a, a, a clique of soldiers that were as young as 12 and 13 years old. Now these were child soldiers. These guys used to fight in gunboats, but they were gun-totting uh, 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 child soldiers. Now all the way from the east of uh, Zaire, as it was uh, then known, these guys marched for eight months, a distance of 2,500 kilometers to Kinshasa. Who was leading them? Mzetatu. This Mzetatu was John Desire Kabila. So Kabila gets power. And uh, as you rightly say, Ms. K, the man gets rid of the Rwandans and the and the Ugandans that actually supported him to to get to power. Now a story is told of a man called uh, Moise Nyara Nyarugabo. This man was a Tutsi from a from an area called South Kivu. Now 
this man was a PA to uh, Loro Desire Kabila. Now, one morning, this uh, guy after the inauguration of Kabila mm -hmm. goes into Kabila's office where Kabila was preparing a list of people to appoint to cabinet. Now, Kabila looks at, looks at him in the eye and tells him, look, I cannot make you minister as that would be two tootsies in my cabinet. I'm very sorry, you can leave now. Just like that, guy was dismissed. Two weeks later, Nyarugabo found, uh, found out through the, uh, his friends that he had been named as a deputy director of a government body charged with expropriating state goods that had been stolen by Mobutu Seseko and his allies. That was an insult. Now, this guy, Kasirikas, he jumps and he goes uh, straight to Loro Desire Kabila. And this is what he tells him. Look, Your Excellency, if I bother you because I'm a Tutsi, I can leave you. It's not a problem. But why did you name all these people to your cabinet who were not with us when we were being attacked? I hid with you under tables when Mobutu was bombing us. I was loyal to you. Mm -hmm. It's a tragic, uh, tra tragic story about, uh, you know, a betrayal of, of, the, of, of the Rwandese and the Ugandans. But one thing, uh, DM and I last year went to, to DRC. And uh, we saw, and I recall this so well, there were two extremes. One mm. was very <coughs> rich and extreme poor. But you'd be shocked of how much the mineral wealth of DRC is. Actually, the value of it is about 24 trillion US dollars. It's mm. actually four, more tri four trillion dollars more than the biggest economy of our, uh, on Earth, and that's the United States. 85 million people, a GDP of less than 50 million USD. Mm. Uh, man, that is a country performing way below its its potential. I just yeah. cannot wait until the time it finds it. Yes. <clears throat> and I don't know when that will be because there's so much uh, complexity in terms of interests yeah. from the region around DRC. Yeah. Uh, as you know, wars need money. Uh, you've talked about the wars, Ms. K. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the financing. Uh, and I'll na narrate uh, some of the parts of the book where he's telling us about how uh, Lohan Kabila uh, found money for, the, for these wars. Mm. And uh, the first thing he says is the first war had been about getting rid of refugee camps. Yeah. Uh, and this was probably precipitated by the, um, the, the, the Rwanda genocide. Ge genocide in Rwanda and yeah. the Hutus crossing over yeah. that they needed to find a solution for. Mm. And, uh, and also that first war had been about overthrowing Mobutu Sisiseko. Yeah. But the second one was about business. Yeah. Um, and so when the second war broke out on August the 2nd, 1998, yeah. Lohan Kabila knew that he didn't have the resources mm. uh, or the army to beat back the Rwandan troops yeah. who were rapidly approaching the capital at that time. Yeah. And indeed, uh, the author reflects, when Kabila sent an urgent delegation to Luanda yes. in Angola to plead for military assistance, yeah. uh, they said to him, first pay us the debt that you owe us. Yes. Uh, and indeed, the uh, uh, DRC owed them about six million yeah. dollars yes. uh, uh, for military support. Yeah. Uh, Zimbabwe yes. uh, also demanded that they be paid their five million dollars yes. uh, for support in, in terms of weapons and equipment. Um, during that first war. Mm. And so we're told, like an entrepreneur trying to fend off bank bankruptcy, Kabila started putting up his country's most valuable assets yes. as collateral to secure further loans yeah. uh, for the war. Yeah. And so what he did is to transform the state corporations into conglomerates, and then he struck partnerships with people from these countries that he was seeking support from. Yeah. So Zimbabwe is one, Angola, South Africa. Yeah. Um, and they signed contracts for timber, petroleum, mining, banking, yeah. and other agricultural projects. <coughs> We're told as well that several banks had been set up at this time to manage those cash flows. Yes. Um, and uh, he was very clever politically uh, because he also set up the, uh, the banks and companies yeah. that would be beneficiaries of all this trading yeah. uh, to benefit both MPs and senators mm. as well as ministers in government. <coughs> yeah. And uh, his front men to mm. run these operations uh, well, people with a very thuggish background. Yes. Uh, so briefly, I'll just mention some of them. Yeah. So he sought to partner with these rough-mannered, unscrupulous businessmen. Yeah. One was Billy Rottenback, yes. who was made director of uh, Gekka Mines, yes. uh, which is the Congolese commodity trading and mining company yeah. headquartered in Lubumbashi. Yes. Now, Rottenback uh, <laughs> was not a very, I mean, unscrupulous yes. completely. This yeah. is a guy who, even in South Africa, uh, yeah. had been charged with, 
uh, you know stealing vehicles yeah. fraud of all sorts uh, of all sorts yeah. um, but the reason Lohan went to him is because he could turn around uh, a profit yes and so he we're told made 20 million dollars uh, from the processing facilities that he acquired over a period of 18 months yeah and every week uh, Lohan would call him and ask him to wire wire him money yeah. uh, for the war yeah um, he made another six million dollars in another mine yeah. uh, and so on and so forth and we're told as well that he had uh, very strong connections to Zimbabwe yes uh, every so often every month actually he'd wire 1.5 to 2 million dollars yeah. to government officials in Zimbabwe yeah. uh, then those include uh, Robert Mugabe uh, Mnangagwa as well was part of the beneficiary there hmm. now uh, another character is a guy called John uh, Breden Camp, also yeah. a Zimbabwean arms dealer. Yeah. He had also been recruited for business. Uh, another one is a South African entrepreneur with a criminal record, a really terrible one, a guy called Nico Sheffer. Yes. Uh, and so that's basically how uh, Mugabe then used these uh, people to run state corporations, to extract money and to fund uh, the armies, all the armies that were supporting him, yeah. as well as the Congolese army. Um, you, you, and you know that's that's the long and short of it. You know, you know what, GM, you, you remind me of a part of this book when they speak of when when Loro Desire Kabila goes to the central bank uh, of of DRC, and this time Butu has gone. He, you know, what he actually finds in the vaults of the central bank, mm -hmm. one fifty franc French note, one. <laughs> but where I was going with this is of the countries that you mentioned. You would be surprised as to how much ingrained that they, uh, they were in the presidential guard of the DRC president. Desire Kabila, uh, Loro, had Rwandese security. The head of uh, his security police mm. uh, escort commander mm. was a Rwandese guy. Mm. The guy who stood outside his door as he slept was a Rwandese guy. Mm. Now, his son, Joseph Kabila, had Zimbabwean security until he, uh, he he got out of power, and that was, what, 2019, November 2019? Mm. And all was because that countries that surrounded uh, DRC were so much entrenched in the East, and with the mines and with the soldiers and everything, mm. that, mm. They, that, that, that uh, they, they felt that they also needed to protect uh, whoever was in charge of DRC. Mm, absolutely. Um, it's a very sad case. Uh, you know, Rwanda as well is involved there uh, financially. Yeah. Um, I do hope that one day uh, DRC will be able to uh, extract itself yes. from all these messy and tangled relationships. Um, it's yeah, a blessing and a curse. I, 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 yes, I will leave. I will leave you with a quote as we some as we finalize today. Uh, we had a winning headline, if you recall, from the uh, from the standard a million in cartoon. Now I'll give you this. This is from a man by the name Asa Philip Randolph. Uh, and he talks about wars. But before that, uh, Philip Randolph is the famous American labor, labor unionist uh, and also a, a socialist politician. And you may not know this, but he's the man who organized the March on Washington in which Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. Now he said, make wars unprofitable and you make them impossible. <laughs> That's the challenge for us if we don't want to see war. Uh, continuing. Yeah. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are also on your TV screens. Find us on Pan Free to Airgo TV and Star Times. Have a good evening.